Good, good afternoon. Hello and a very warm welcome to the second of our lunch hour lectures this term. And hello also to those who are watching us online, um, who can also ask questions, and you can ask questions too. Uh, if, you're, if you are online and you want to ask questions, then you can either go to quitter, uh, Twitter at ucl.lhl um, or the Sligo site uh, for which the hash co hashtag is 8821. Um, well, having done that, um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor David Shanks uh, from the Department of um, uh, Philosophy, uh, sorry, Psychology and Language Sciences. Um, uh, with, his, uh, with his lecture entitled, Does Social Science Tell the Truth? Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, I'd like to be able to stand here and give an affirmative answer to this question that I've posed, but I'm afraid the um, social sciences have taken something of a battering in the last few years. And we've come to uh, learn that many of the methods that we use may not be quite as robust as we would like them to be. Uh, we now have major ongoing efforts to check the reproducibility and the reliability of the kinds of things that we have taken for granted, the findings that we have put faith in and built our theories on. And this scrutiny of our methods is taking place across all the social sciences in economics, in political science, for example, uh, education research, uh, linguistics, sociology, and so on. The, the problems that I'm going to be talking about, and probably the remedies as well, are pretty general across the social science spectrum. I'm a psychologist, as you've heard, and I'm going to be giving a, a sort of very brief um, chronology of some of the events in the last few years that have been you know, particularly influential on my thinking about these issues. It is a little bit psychology oriented, but I do want to emphasize that these concerns span all of the social sciences. And the other thing to say is that psychology, regrettably, has been, you know, has really borne the brunt of a lot of the criticisms. We have been uh, very badly tarnished by some of the things that have been discovered. But the good news is that that has motivated many of my colleagues in the field to be, I think, at the forefront of thinking about uh, remedies and methods to, to create stronger social science. And that's what I want to do today by picking out some particularly salient events from the recent history, uh, telling you about what, you know, what the original event was, and using them as a case study to introduce some of the, uh, the methods that have been developed in the intervening time right up to the current day, which perhaps will help us build a, a, a more solid stock of evidence so that perhaps somebody giving a talk under this title in 10 or 20 years' time will give a, a, a rather different answer. So our story begins uh, around uh, six, seven years ago, 2010. And I want to introduce you to this lady at the top left whose name is Amy Cuddy. And she um, was uh, a co-author in 2010 of um, a, a very uh, attention-grabbing study. You may have come across this notion of power posing. This was the study done by Donna Carney, Amy Cuddy, and Andy Yap, and uh, published in a quite high-profile, prestigious psychology journal. And basically what they uh, reported in their, in their study was that Striking a power pose, shoulders back, chest out, uh, assertive pose, for just a couple of minutes could have quite striking effects, not only internally, but also externally. So, for example, they measured testosterone levels in their participants in this study. And they found that striking this power pose, as illustrated by these... Uh, image at the bottom, uh, elevated testosterone levels compared to a, in a control group where, where the participants didn't adopt that pose. And of course, testosterone is associated with aggression, assertiveness, status. So you could imagine that if you were going to go into a job interview, 
you might, you know, you might want to get a little boost to your assertiveness. And a, 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 an incredibly simple two-minute uh, intervention in which you take this pose could have really powerful effects. They also found that after uh, taking a power pose, participants are much more willing to uh, accept risks, to take risky um, <coughs> choices. Well, um, <clears throat> that became an, an incredibly um, well-discussed and, and broadcast piece of research. Um, picked up in all sorts of media outlets. This is the image of Amy Cuddy, who's she's uh, built a big career around the power posing literature, and she gives lectures on it and has written a book on it. Um, this is the, uh, the, the front of her TED talk. You can see the number at the bottom of that. It says 36 million. That's how many people have viewed her power posing video. It's one of the all-time most viewed TED talks. And it's been incredibly influential. Some of you may recognize this individual <laughs> who was um, widely ridiculed at the Conservative Party conference a couple of years ago, coming out and standing like this. And everybody thought, what's he doing? Um, he was presumably, you know, maybe he had this idea that by striking this power pose, he could not only, you know, uh, exert a, an, an impression of power on the audience, but also internally boost his own... Uh, testosterone and give a more assertive speech. Uh, not that it did him a great deal of good. Well, why am I telling you all this? I I'm telling you all this because it turns out probably to be completely untrue that power posing can have these effects. And the story is going on to the present day. This is a post on Dana Carney's website from just last week, I think perhaps two weeks ago in which she posted a statement saying that she now, in the light of numerous failures to reproduce these findings in the intervening five or six years, now no longer believes the effects. As such, I do not believe the power pose effects are real. Amy Cuddy, one of the co-authors, actually has come in and completely distanced herself from that conclusion. She, she still believes that the effects are real. There are many, many lessons from this kind of um, example, and I could have given you many examples of this, of influential research that's turned out to be very difficult to reproduce. But the one uh, lesson I want to draw from this is around um, this obsession that social scientists have with this notion of statistical significance. We do our studies, and at the end of them, we come up with this thing called a p-value, which many of you will be familiar with, but if you're not, it's basically you're trying to calculate a probability. What, what would be the probability of getting the effect that you observe in your experiment if there really is no difference? You know, if, if the truth is that there's no effect of power posing, how likely would it be that you would see a difference between the, the, the control group and the experimental group of the, of, of the sort that you did see? And convention has it that one seeks to find a probability that's less than 5%, or probably 0.05. There's no reason, there's no, nothing magical about that five percentage num number, but it's just become embedded in the way that behavioral researchers, social search researchers generally do their studies. And if you do your study and you find that the effect is statistically significant, meaning the probability is less than 5%, then glory awaits you. Your study will be published in a high prestige journal like Psychological Science. You'll get promoted, you'll get the invitation to do a TED talk. If your effect is not significant, if it comes out at higher than 0.5, what happens? Well, probably what happens is that your study disappears into your filing cabinet and never sees the light of day. Now, one thing that we, we have learned in the intervening period during, um, during which these replication failures have been accumulating is that this obsession with p-values is a very poor way of assessing the evidence that we're acquiring in our research. And um, other methods have become um, popular in, in the intervening period. And here I'm just showing you a screenshot of a piece of software that's been developed and is now freely available called JASP. This is a statistical software package uh, that's free to download. And you can use this to do conventional statistical testing, and it will give you a p-value. 
But what's more interesting is that you can use it to do completely different forms of evaluation of, of, of evidence, particularly around Bayesian methods. And these Bayesian methods don't yield a p-value. P-value has nothing to do with them. Uh, they are methods for aggregating evidence and telling you really how much support do you have for your experimental hypothesis. One of the, um, I think it's quite important that these forms of software actually are, become, are available freely and that you don't really need to be a statistical expert, you don't need a PhD in statistics to be able to understand what these tools are doing and to incorporate them in your research. One of the other things that these sort of alternative statistical methods illustrate very, uh, very obviously is that for many studies, even though they might achieve this magical 0.05 level, a Bayesian approach will tell us that the sample sizes are way too small. And this is epidemic in social science research, that we study the phenomena that we're interested in with um, sample sizes in our experiments that are much too small. Well, not long after um, that work came to prominence, um, there was another development which um, uh, played, played, I think, quite a big role in, in how social sciences are reforming themselves. And I want to illustrate this by um, this reference to a, a, a website that was created by Hal Pashler and Bobby Spellman and their colleagues around 2011. So I've emphasized that what, you know, one of the problems with this, this magical 0.05 um, cutoff is that if your study doesn't give you a statistically significant result, there is a strong tendency to bury it in your filing cabinet. And the problem with that is that it means that things that do get published in the journals are actually not a proper representation of the state of the world. They're a biased sample of the evidence. Well, we now live, I mean, you know, we now take it for granted that we live in a cloud era where storing information and making it publicly available on websites is, a, is essentially free and, and, and trivial, almost costless uh, in terms of time and, and effort as well. But back in 2011, this was quite a novelty. And the idea behind this website was that it simply um, operated as a repository for researchers to upload brief reports about any replication experiments that they had undertaken. The sorts of things that they maybe wouldn't even try to publish in a journal, even if they did try, likely the response would be that the journal wouldn't be particularly interested. But rather than burying them so that they're publicly invisible, the website allows these um, reports of the studies to be publicly available for other researchers to see how much evidence there is, how, many, you know, how easy or difficult has it proved to replicate a particular study. And very quickly when this website was created, it was found that there were hotspots. So there would be particular um, uh, findings in the literature, like the power pose finding, where lots of people would suddenly be uploading their descriptions of their failed experiments. And then, of course, that, that gains traction and um, can make its way through, ultimately, to correcting the literature. Nowadays, you know, this was 2011, now we find that many journals have actually created special sections uh, routinely for publishing replication attempts. So it, there is recognition of this difficulty uh, of uh, disseminating failed replication studies and trying to make that easier through the normal publishing process. Well, 2011 was a, a, a bad year for, for my field, for psychology, um, in another respect, which is that this individual, some of you may recognize, Diedrich Stapel, was um, unmasked as a, a, a fraud, uh, as a, a data fabricator and he lost his job um, as a consequence of that, and subsequently has had to retract uh, 58 um, journal articles. He had been making up data for quite a long period of time. This is all now on record because he actually wrote an autobiography, which is freely available on the, on the internet and is an absolutely fascinating read for uh, a variety of reasons. But, um, 
you know, so we have it from his voice that he was engaged in data fabrication. Unfortunately, we have found that he's not alone, and these are some other individuals who in the, in the last few years have also been revealed to have been involved in data malpractice. Uh, if you look at that and think, hmm, there's a bit of a gender um, <laughs> asymmetry there, uh, that's because, I mean, there is now quite good evidence um, that um, data malpractice is actually much more prevalent amongst men than women, even controlling for the different proportions of males and females in different um, scientific disciplines. Well, the reason that I'm uh, referring to this is, um, is because in, in at least a couple of these cases, um, particularly around Lawrence Sanna and Dirk Smeesters, the, the evidence that, that they had been engaged in data fabrication came from um, statistical detective work undertaken by people who looked very, very carefully at some of their published um, research articles and who found that there were various things in those reports where you would have expected things to be random but which looked distinctly non-random and eventually led to, led to unraveling of, of, of the fabrication that had been going on. But of course, that kind of data exploration, I mean, occasionally you might be able to do it on, the, on the, the very small amount of data that makes its way into the published research article. Much more healthy would be if the raw, all the data, the raw data, all the data collected in your research was publicly available. Um, the, the actual behavior of each participant in your experiment in addition to the summary data that makes its way into the, um, the final publication. So open data becomes a really important aspect of uh, attempts to, to weed out data irregularities. Because of course, you know, you'd have to be a very, very brave person to fabricate data at the level of individual participants and make it publicly available because uh, it's very difficult to fake randomness on a large scale. Well, open data sounds good in principle. How achievable is it? Actually, almost every journal has a policy that if you publish in a journal, you should make your data available. But we know that this doesn't work. We know that if you, if you send off requests, let's say to 100 random uh, authors of published articles asking for their data, your success rate will be something like 25%. Authors come up with all sorts of reasons why they don't feel it's appropriate to let you see their original data. Some reasons may be perfectly valid if, uh, if they've done a trial of a particular, you know, in, in medicine, for example, where there might be worries about anonymity. But in the main, it's very difficult to get the data. And you come up with a lot of sort of, you know, the dog ate my homework type responses. So what can we do? Well, um, what I want to tell you about now is, uh, is quite a nice little psychology uh, uh, intervention, uh, which looks quite promising. So what I'm showing here is um, an article from a recent issue of the journal Psychological Science. The actual content of this article is not, is not the point here. But what I want to do is to point your attention to those little three colored symbols appearing on the, the title page of this published article. These are badges. Uh, the blue badge is awarded to authors of a paper if they make their data publicly available through a, an open repository, a public repository, at the time of publication. The orange badge is for making the actual experimental materials available, and the red badge is for pre-registering the study, which means giving a full description of what the study is going to entail and how the data are going to be analyzed, prior to any data collection taking place. And you get these little badges. Now you might think, well, you know, how is that going to affect anybody's behavior? It's a trivial little symbol appearing on the front page of an article. In actual fact, there's reason to believe that this kind of uh, little badging uh, operates as quite a successful nudge to authors. What's shown here is some data from a, a study um, undertaken last year. Uh, my PhD student, Tom Hardwick, was, was part of this study, where they've looked at the, 
um, proportion of articles published in this journal, Psychological Science, before and after the introduction of the badge um, uh, procedure, the badge mechanism. And you can see that it shoots up uh, after the dotted line, which is when the badges were introduced. And along the bottom in the, the, these other gray bars are a series of comparator journals in the same sort of area, which hasn't, haven't introduced any badges. So, of course, that's not conclusive proof, but it's pretty suggestive, I think, that um, you can get uh, small nudges to influence people's behavior. People want, I think, there is you know, evidence, really, that people want to adopt good practices in their research. And maybe they just need a little bit of a nudge to do so. Well, still around um, 2012, 2013, um, we now turn to an intervention by um, this individual here, perhaps some of you will recognize as the Nobel Prize winner, Danny Kahneman. Um, Kahneman uh, won the Nobel Prize for economics, but let me make it absolutely clear that he's a psychologist. <laughs> card-carrying psychologist. What um, Kahneman did in, in 2012, I mean, these um, issues around replication difficulty were beginning to, to get a lot of coverage, and Kahneman uh, sent round an email to a closed group of um, colleagues expressing grave concern about the, the health of some aspects of research in psychology, particularly around some aspects of social psychology. Um, now, when a Nobel Prize winner sort of expresses views on the health or otherwise of, of a field, people tend to pay attention to that, quite rightly. Um, but they also paid attention because Kahneman used some, some quite evocative language. This was a news item reporting um, his email. Of course, his email went completely viral. It got circulated to more and more people, and eventually it just became a big news story in its own right. He said, for example, I can see a train wreck looming. This is, this is powerful um, and evocative language for particularly around the, these areas in social psychology. Your field is now the poster child for doubts about the integrity of psychological research. Well, um, at this t uh, roughly at this time, I myself started to become very interested in, in the kinds of research that Kahneman was pointing to. And this is really research about how you can um, tweak people's behavior, you can influence people's behavior by very subtle or uh, possibly even unconscious um, signals that you provide to them. And it turned out that there were some examples of this that were probably not reproducible despite them being very prominent and, and figuring in textbooks and so on. And so I want to tell you about one example of this. Um, that we've had a look at, which leads into a, another sort of recommendation, an area in which, in, in which research has, has been trying to modify itself. So um, this is a book, actually, which summarized a lot of research carried out by Douglas Kenrick and Vladas Grishevigas and their colleagues, all around the idea um, that the, the brain is made up of a series of modules. So you have a module for gaining status, for instance you have a module for mating. And these modules will have a long uh, evolutionary history to them. And subtle signals, unconscious signals in, in your environment can activate these modules and affect your behavior, particularly around things like uh, taking risks. So this is the kind of research um, that, that fell under this this umbrella heading, this is a study, I'm not going to go into details of it, but basically a study that if you subtly suggest to women that they might have a sexual rival for their partner, that increases, apparently, that increases their willingness to consume dangerous dieting pills or to go and get a suntan. Okay. Now, we were a little bit skeptical about some of these findings. Um, and we, this is one of the things that we did in our research. Um, we, we looked at all of the studies that had been conducted and, uh, on, on these uh, sort of mating uh, effects on risk-taking behavior. And what's shown in this graph here is e each of the data points is a particular study that was conducted and published in the literature. 
And what's shown along the x-axis here is the size of the effect. So you can see that everything is greater than zero. Zero here would mean no effect being found of this subtle um, unconscious influence. And the further right the data points are, the bigger the effect. So they vary, uh, and an effect of size 1 or 1.5 is quite a large effect. And what also is plotted in the graph is the precision of the, uh, of the estimate. And, and this is basically measured in terms of sample size. So very large sample sizes, big experiments comparing large groups, are uh, shown higher up on the y-axis, and small studies down here um, lower on the y-axis. What you can see here is clearly there is a very strong relationship between these two things. What is that telling us? There should, you know, really, there shouldn't be a relationship. Um, there's no reason why the size, of your, you know, the size of your samples affects the estimate that you make of an effect. But one possible explanation, a likely explanation for what's happening here, is the publication bias effect that I talked about a few minutes ago in terms of the file draw. If you do a small study, you have to get a very big effect in order for it to be statistically significant and for it, in order for it to be publishable in a journal. If you do, uh, if you do an experiment um, with small sample sizes, if there is no true effect at all, you're quite likely to get a non-significant result and the study disappears into your filing cabinet and never gets published. So that's why you might expect to see data points down here to the right at the bottom. If you do a very large study, it can uh, yield statistical significance, even if the effect size that it acquires is quite small. But I hope you can see here that um, you know, it's not too hard to, um, to imagine that if you extrapolate up here a little bit to up here and do, do a study again with quite a large sample, you're probably going to get an effect that's getting vanishingly small. And indeed, we ourselves did lots of uh, attempts to replicate these experiments with complete lack of success. All our data points fell up here. And the, in, the conclusion that I want to draw from this is that um, yeah, we need methods, as we've used here, for uh, analyzing uh, entire subfields of research, not just looking at individual studies and asking whether they're reproducible or not, but methods called meta-analytic methods, where you look at a whole body of, uh, of research to try to assess its, its robustness. So this is, this is a meta-analysis in which we're pooling lots of data, lots of different studies. We can't, um, we can't from this draw any conclusions about individual studies, but we can say that uh, uh, the entire body of research is, um, is looking quite um, dubious in the conclusions that it might uh, want to support. And now we have um, many, many ongoing methods being developed uh, in the meta-analysis field. These are just a few examples where techniques are being devised that you can apply to a body of research to ask whether it's, it's healthy or not. So how do we go about reforming social science? I've suggested a few things. We need to look at alternatives to this magical p-value cliff. We need to give much more uh, um, visibility and accessibility to replication studies, open data, pre-registration and badges and so on. And I hope that by developing these sorts of methods and embedding them more in the field and particularly training young researchers with these best practice methods, maybe we'll be able to come back in the future with a slightly more robust social science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. I enjoyed that. Now, um, it's time for uh, questions. Um, it's open to you from the floor. When you ask a question, just hang on uh, for the microphone to arrive. <laughs> and there's one down here, which is an online question. Hello, David. Thank you very much. Um, this question is coming from our Slido webpage, um, and it's sort of related to how you opened uh, with the talk about power posing, I think. So the question is, do you think popular science, inverted commas, and social media has impacted what is regarded as true? 
Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, clearly, you know, th I think there are concerns about the, the connection between academic research published in scholarly journals that's gone through an editorial process, and then how that makes its way into the media and how that gets picked up. And we've, you know, examples like uh, the autism and MMR um, uh, episode highlight, I think, beyond question, the, 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 the worries that can arise as a result of getting that translation wrong. So I think there's responsibility at both ends. I mean, I think clearly academics need to recognize you know, the, the responsibilities that they take on when they give a message out into the world, particularly you know, on something that could be a matter of health or life and death um, to, to people. But also, one does worry sometimes about the media and, and news outlets, that they just have this sort of uncritical desire to absorb anything that uh, any scientist says, and, and that can lead to concerns as well. Now, there's a question from just behind, right where you are. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what you think about the, um, a different field, medical, medicine, where I think the same sort of thing, see, I don't, I'm not working in the field, but especially as regards open data, yes. and I mean there's recent case of um, statin business where, where NICE guidelines have taken over, NICE have taken some guidelines over, um, but there's still a lot of data in that that's not been released, I believe, but there's a lot of other I think I'm, I follow a group called All Trials and, and to try and get open data, but have you got any information? I, of course, in, in the medical fields, these issues around um, pre-registering studies and making the data openly available have been part of the discussion for a long time. You have concerns about drug trials, for example, where drug companies are not necessarily making publicly available failed trials. But in terms of open data, of course, in, in, in medicine and in some other areas as well, one does have to be extremely careful. I mean, there are all sorts of issues about confidentiality and anonymity. When a participant comes along to take part in your study, whether it's a medical study or a study of power posing, they, go, they sign a consent form. The study has been through an ethical approval. Did that ethical approval explicitly request that the, you know, that the participant would consent to their data being made publicly available. So you know, if you're looking at a study that might have been done five or 10 years ago and, and people are asking for the data to be made available, if the participants didn't consent to that, quite difficult to, for the researchers to make the data available. And of course, there are issues about anonymity. If you're doing a study on a particularly rare health condition, for instance, if the data were made publicly available, even anonymized, would you be able to figure out who, you know, who a particular participant is? So these are quite tricky areas. I would say that the, the UK Research Councils and the government has recently published a concordat on open data. And it's quite nuanced in, in thinking about some of these issues. But it does say, you know, clearly, in, 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 in many research areas, uh, there is huge scope for more openness of the data. Thank you for that. And there's a question just, just here. Um, the microphone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this one. Hello. This is a completely new topic to me entirely. But bearing in mind what we've been talking about, particularly the last couple of questions about, about the use of data and responsibility, what efforts do editors of these very fine journals take to uh, inform readers, particularly historical uh, mass media uh, uh, outlets, uh, television and what have you, to, to say this was a very small sample and what is more, the authors of this study did not allow their data to be uh, uh, open data, therefore take it with a massive pinch of salt and indeed we're a bit embarrassed to be publishing it anyway because <laughs> it's all it could all be a bit iffy bearing in mind what we know about small samples well the journals are, you know i think the journals bear some culpability here i mean i think you have journals like science and nature so we know there is good evidence that 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 um research published in science is less likely to be true than research published elsewhere for behavioral research. 
These are commercial entities. They are trying to justify their very, very high subscription rates. And one way that they do that is by, you know, very, you know, attention-grabbing research on topics like power posing and many, many other things. They could respond by not publishing that kind of research, you know, if, it, if it's not open, if it doesn't have big sample sizes and so on. But they, you know, they are conflicted on the one hand wanting to sell subscriptions, but on the other hand being gatekeepers of research. And I think we have a long way to go before we reconcile that. I would say, though, that there are some journals like PLOS One, which now demands, you know, you can't publish there unless you make your data available. There are some exceptions to that which are perfectly reasonable, but in the main you have to publish your data. And that is a very positive, I think, development for a journal to take. And the question is over there. Um, what you, would you say about using different statistical analysis to, uh, to work on the same data set? You usually arrive at different results, especially when considering data transformation yes. and imputation. I mean, yeah. you just look for what's working sometimes. Of course, and that, that is I mean, it's a very good question. And this is part of the problem. I mean, the, the reason why many studies turn out not to be reproducible is because authors collected small amounts of data and they, they, they basically pummeled the data until they yielded a significant result. They transformed them. Maybe they dropped one or two participants who they thought were outliers. They did all of these things after the fact, in other words, after getting the data. And of course, that just massively increases the likelihood that you will get a false result. So what is the remedy? I mean, I think partly the remedy is statistical, you know, to, 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 use, to make it very clear what you've done so that others can see the strengths and weaknesses of what you've done. But also, if the data themselves are there, then others can try other statistical techniques to see how, you know, do you get a significant result only if you do transformation X and, and so on. Um, but also, I, I briefly mentioned pre-registration, and that is terribly important because when you pre-register a study, you, you are effectively tying your own hands. You're, you're saying how you're going to analyze the data. You're saying what is your sample size. You're saying when are you going to end data collection and so on. Any question here? Um, do you think there's anything to be said for the idea that maybe social sciences, like for example psychology, um, there's a lot of pressure nowadays to make them uh, as clear cut as the harder sciences such as biology or physics or something like that, um, and that maybe part of the problem is changing um, the public perception of these social sciences so that they come to realise that actually it's not, a, there's never going to be, or there's not quickly going to be a definitive answer on um, how certain things affect behavior and things like that. And maybe it's, yeah, partly to do with how people perceive these social sciences and how clear cut they are and they can be. Well, I think that's, yes, that's an interesting question. I mean, I would hope that, you know, for, for a psychology study or a political science study or a physics study, I mean, what you do is, is, is in a particular situation, a particular context with particular participants. To the extent that you can recreate that, we want, we want the findings to be robust. Now, it's true that in, 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 in social science subjects, things probably do vary more across contexts. Uh, and, you know, across time and so on, things vary in ways that they don't in, in physics. Um, but let me just make the point, by the way, that, I mean, these problems are, are widespread in the social sciences. I think the problems are perhaps a bit wider than many people uh, recognize in physics and chemistry and other subjects as well. I mean, there are surveys now which have been done which, in which the vast majority of practicing chemists estimate the reproducibility of research in their field to be way less than 100%, 70 80%. Now, that's survey data, but it strongly suggests that people in those hard science fields have experienced themselves of difficulty reproducing some of the other things that are published. Thank you very much for that. I think it's the last we've got time for. In a, in a, in a world that's driven by metrics and lead tables, I think we lean very heavily on the journals uh, in order to try and lead some 
uh, lead the way here and exercise on di di discipline beyond the, the, the badger's technique. But anyway, thank you very much indeed, uh, David, for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you.